Hey everybody, kickstart your comic! I'm Gary Scott Beatty, publisher, editor, illustrator, writer, colorist, and letterer of comic books and graphic novels. People ask, how do you make a living in comics? Well, I don't work for Marvel or DC, but I pay the bills, and publishing is all I do. In this blog, we'll look at the highs and lows of being a creative professional. I'll share some cool art and story with you. We'll talk comics, and we'll explore the answer to that question, how do you make a living in comics? Hi everybody, this is Gary Scott Beatty, fully recovered from my last video during my Kickstarter, which ended up at 142% of goal. So this uh, video is on Kickstart Your Comics, and I've uh, got a lot of information to go through, so let's get started. The Kickstarter led directly to the publishing of my latest book. Let's go! This is uh, something you should uh, download if you're a creative professional. Uh, Azern.com slash resources.pdf. It has some uh, good information for creative professionals that I've collected over the last couple of years. Uh, if you want to join our pro email list, you can go to IndieComicsMagazine.com slash pro.html and that has uh, uh, information about Azer Publishing and the things that we publish, but also has resources for creative professionals when I come upon them, uh, things that I think are really important for people to know. Uh, a little intro <coughs> about me. I've been coloring and lettering since 1999. My first comics were through Diamond in 2008. Uh, that same year I landed a Zurich grant, which uh, I, I published Jazz Cool Bird is a murder mystery in a jazz club that uh, has art inspired by 50s album cover design. Uh, Caliber Comics just recently collected those three um, those three comic books from 2008 in a graphic novel called Worlds uh, that I had downstairs and is also available on Amazon. Uh, 2011 I started Indie Comics Magazine did 10 of those and just rebooted as Indie Comics 1, 2, and 3. I have Indie Comics 1, 2, 3 downstairs. Or you can also find those uh, digitally through Amazon. Um, what that is is a, uh, I got together with some friends to start it and uh, we pool our resources. In other words, we all pay. And then we split the, di the diamond invoice with diamond pays. And then the remainder of a thousand books we split amongst the creators. So it's kind of a way to buy books and get diamond exposure also. And those are uh, those are eight page short stories. Um, I printed one of 2014's best indie comics called Number One, according to Bleeding Cool. That was one of the best indie comics of that year uh, with uh, artist Aaron Warner. And Number One is a, uh, is a comic shop owner comic. It's a story about a comic shop owner. It's not comedy, it's drama. I actually, uh, actually brought a reviewer to tears with that one. It's the first time that's ever happened to me. That's kind of a feather in my hat for a writer. Uh, uh, the beginning of this year, I had my first successful Kickstarter. That means that uh, a couple of years ago, I had another Kickstarter that, that failed. Um, it uh, was Strange Horror 1, 2, and 3, and when we reached 142% of the goal, which is a bad um, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have all the answers. There's people uh, on this resources PDF that do have more of the answers. I ended up listening to the Comics Launch podcast for nearly a year before I even did my Kickstarter. I mean, you've got to gather information because uh, your project is, uh, is specific to what you're doing. You, you really, there's no cookie cutter way to do it. Um, and they're very good at comics launch. That's comics with an X. The podcasts are great when you're working, when you're drawing or coloring or something. You can turn on a podcast and, uh, and get all kinds of information in while you're creating. Um, so have you guys back to Kickstarter at all? Anybody back to Kickstarter? Okay. It's really a good idea to do that if you're going to, if you're interested in starting a Kickstarter to see how other people run their, run their Kickstarters. Um, let's see, uh, there's been over 123,000 projects funded, there's nearly $3 billion pledged so far to Kickstarter projects, so the money is there. 
Um, there's over 12 million total backers and over 4 million repeat backers, which is really important that uh, it, uh, Kickstarter has a sense of community. So it's really a good idea if you're gonna start a Kickstarter project to go in and bid on some Kickstarter uh, projects so they know you're a part of the community. Uh, I think they're more willing, the Kickstarter community itself is more willing to back your project if you've shown that you're interested in other people's uh, projects also. Uh, 15 categories on Kickstarter in the comics category. Uh, there was over 57 million pledged to successful projects, and that success rate is around 53%. That doesn't sound very high, but comics is the third highest success rate of any Kickstarter category. So other categories are have much less success rates than 53%. But that also means that, what, 47% fail. And why do they fail? Well, that's what I'm hoping to address here. One thing I do want to point out though is for your, for your project to sell, you should be uh, uh, honest and clearly presented with your information. You know, you want to be, uh, you want to be short and to the point and uh, really present your presentation in a clear way. Um, you set amount you need to raise, you set a time limit, typically it's 30 days. I went, went ahead and did it 29 days because I started on a Tuesday and I ended on a Thursday only because with the people I contact at least, I know that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are the biggest internet days. And if you look at the uh, comics that uh, that are given away free online, most of them come out on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I don't know why, but that's a big day for maybe screwing around at the office or something and <laughs> going into the websites. Um, <clears throat> that's an all or nothing funding model. In other words, if you don't reach your funding, then it all just goes away which is a lot of work and time for you to put into something that goes away, but at least you're not printing a thousand books and have them in your garage and end up selling, <laughs> selling 10 of them. Which believe me, a lot of indie comic publishers do that. They've got inventory all over the place. It's just a great way to pre-sell your product. Well, let's turn this page here. This, isn't this a nice, Thing to think. If you build it, they will come. That's from Field of Dreams. Well, this is really ridiculous. Don't pay attention to that. This is the stupidest thing to work into uh, our, you know, America's lexicon that I think that I've ever heard. Because um, if you build it and people don't know what's there, they will not come. You have to do that with your Kickstarter. I'm going to start marketing. I'm going to talk about marketing now. So. Marketing is not buying ads, it's a system of communication letting people know what you have and how to find it and how to uh, enjoy it. All right, first is the pre-launch. <clears throat> the pre-launch is the most important part of your Kickstarter project because if you don't hit, hit a certain number of pledges when you first start, there's no way you're gonna catch up. Um, the usual usual wave is that you get a big wave of, of uh, pledges at the beginning. There's a dead zone they call in the middle where you get hardly anything and at the end it picks up again. That's only if you're letting people know about it. Um, the most important thing is the pitch. <coughs> we talk about the pitch in the entertainment industry a lot. Uh, in the movie industry they call it the elevator pitch. In other words, if you get in an, ele in an elevator and a movie producer is next to you in the elevator uh, and you're going to tell him about your movie project, then you're going to have to be able to tell it like that. It's going to have to be a sentence, sentence and a half, two sentences. This is what my project is. Um, I notice that all the time at conventions, uh, uh, creators, they'll be, they'll be sitting behind their booth and they'll have their heads down like this and they'll be drawing and stuff. And, uh, really, they should have their heads up and be talking to people, but you know, mm -hmm. artists are, are kind of shy. And when somebody asks them about their comic book project, they uh, go into this long tirade about, oh, it's these worlds and it, it's these characters and these guys and these machines and this happens and all of this history. That's not a pitch. Right. And you, you notice people's eyes glaze over when they're going through all of that. That's not the way to do it. You gotta say it in a sentence. Uh, let's see, give me an example. 
Uh, indie Comics that I produce is uh, 36 pages of the best uh, art and story from independent comic book creators. Boom, that says everything. It doesn't say anything about what the stories are, it doesn't go into characters, it's just what this is. Uh, Jazz Midnight is, uh, like I said before, is a murder mystery in a jazz club in 1957 with art inspired by 50s album cover design. No plot at all in there except that it's a murder mystery. Uh, Worlds, the graphic novel that uh, collects those stories, is uh, the first Gary Scott Beatty retrospective. I could go into a little more detail on that, but I think that kind of says it all. Number one that I was talking about earlier is a done-in-one comic about a uh, comic book, uh, uh, a comic store owner. A drama about a comic store owner. See, those are pitches, those, and that's the, the most important thing about your pre-launch, is to have a decent pitch. You gotta nail what you're doing down to, uh, you know, the Star Wars universe, for instance, has all of these multiple things that are going on, but it all boils down to uh, a single pitch. Anybody know what, uh, what, what Lucas used to sell that first Star Wars movie? I think he said something, I think he called it a space western or something like that. You know, when you think about it, that's a great pitch, especially to people who had never experienced Star Wars before, which is really different from anything going on at the time. Makes right? sense. Yeah, yeah. Great pitch. And it worked. So, Strange Horror on Kickstarter. Okay, on Facebook, I had over uh, 2,500 likes on Facebook. Um, Eastern Publishing, my other Facebook page had over 400, and my personal page, I had nearly a thousand friends. So uh, on my pre-launch, I'm building community. I mean, this is, if you write your Kickstarter project, uh, and you back other Kickstarter projects, like I said, you build an audience. So that on my Facebook page, those that's part of my building my audience. Also, uh, MailChimp.com is the place I use to build my uh, to build my fan email list because an email list is really important to let people know what's going on and you don't want to start your email list when you start your project when you start your Kickstarter or when you print a book or whatever you have to do that way ahead of time and start getting people interested uh, you want to avoid spam because spam makes people angry but a place like MailChimp um, you sign up you get people to sign up to your fan list and then they send that, that person an email that has to send that back to MailChimp. And that's how they get out of the spam thing. They make absolutely sure that this person is signing up for this thing and then they actually want it. And it's easy to unsubscribe at any time. All of this needs to be done way before, you're, before you even think about doing your Kickstarter. A couple of weeks before your Kickstarter, you should start a Facebook event and invite all of these friends that you have been building up to to join the Facebook event and you know give away little things on that and uh, uh, keep people entertained. It's very important to keep people entertained through this whole process. So not only should you have your Kickstarter book done or close to done, but you should also have other things to entertain people with. Uh, sketches, uh, preliminary drawings, finished drawings, maybe that don't even have anything to do with the book. You just have to keep them visually uh, excited about what you're doing. That's very important. Okay. Um, you write your Kickstarter, right? I don't know why that's at the top, because that should be further down here, but that's a part of your pitch. Your pitch that I talked about before, that short description should be right there at the top. Uh, to know how to write a Kickstarter, a successful Kickstarter project, go into Kickstarter and look at successful Kickstarter projects. Find the ones that are close to what you're doing. Uh, something that's close to your own comic book project. See how they worded it. You know, see how they kept people from getting all bored, like maybe you guys are with me talking up here. Um, how they how they kept people from getting bored reading about their project. Um, show some work. It's very important to be visual in Kickstarter, uh, especially on a comic book project, because a comic book is a visual thing. Um, set up your reward levels, and how do I set up for reward levels? We'll see how other people have done it. Uh, you need to have a good spread of prices, because 
some people they they go in and they spend five to ten bucks on a Kickstarter, and that's that's what they do. It's that's all they do. You know? So you have to have something in that five to ten dollar category for them to to uh, to bid on or to bid. Uh, what are they called? Uh, backers to back. Me, I had a dollar. The first issue, the Strange War one, two, and three. The first issue you could get for a dollar. It was digital, easy to uh, send to people. Because uh, I looked at a lot of Kickstarter projects, and a lot of people have a dollar support our project. And didn't give them anything. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'll give you something. I'll give you uh, Strange War number one for a dollar. Of course, you needed Strange War one, two, and three to get all three of those continued stories. So uh, later on, I could try to talk them into maybe going higher in their bid. So that's the pre-launch, and that is the most important part of your Kickstarter project, is thinking it out ahead of time. Launch day! You guys can't see this back there, can you? I can. Can you? I can. I can. All right. On launch day, uh, I have several websites that I redirected directly to the Kickstarter, so that when people went to the website, it didn't go to the website, it went to the Kickstarter. Um, because you're going to be bank borrowing and, and stealing from people, well, maybe not stealing, but your life is going to be absorbed with getting people to to pledge to your Kickstarter. It's it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a terrible month that you go through. So I re redirected my website. I saturated social media, and this is just on launch day. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Enough, this is something else you have to set up ahead of time. You don't want to do it when you start your project. That's part of the pre-launch, is set up your Facebook, set up your Twitter. Get used to using it, know what it's all about, see what other people are doing with it. Uh, I send a news release out to media. Media don't do a lot of coverage of, of uh, Kickstarter projects because everybody and his cousin has a Kickstarter project. But I have some contacts that because I've been doing comics since 2008 and I did get some coverage mainly because one of my reward tiers was original music. Believe it or not, I was looking for something I could deliver, deliver digitally and I, I'm a recovering musician so I went ahead and did up some scary music uh, that is now available to, to purchase. Um, and make sure you send a personal thanks to each backer. It's a very personal thing, uh, Kickstarter. You think, oh, you're trying to get a thousand people in or something. You're trying to get 300 people in to pledge at a certain level. But it's an extremely personal thing. Uh, you have to make sure that every person who pledges that you knows that you very much appreciate what they did. Not only for this Kickstarter, but if you have a successful Kickstarter, you are way more likely to have your next Kickstarter be successful. So you're building up an audience, you're building up people that uh, like what you do, and uh, you have to be nice. A salesman once told me, people buy things from people they like. Your campaign, okay, you got my, I, this is how I set up my rewards. You have a reward system before you reach your goal and a reward system after you reach your goal. Before you reach your goal, you're trying to push people toward that dollar amount, toward that goal. After you reach that dollar amount, you're trying to get them to skip up to another dollar amount. So you're always, uh, this is great way to do things, by the way, because it's always an event. It's always something happening from a marketing perspective. That's great. I did milestone rewards. And 20%, 50%, 75, and 90. And what those were were eight page stories that I uh, drew and inked and colored and lettered and wrote uh, digitally that I digitally sent off to people. Uh, my stretch goals were at 1,200 and 1,300 because 1,000 was my, was my dollar goal. And the 1,300 one was a pretty, uh, pretty impressive because it was 42 pages. But it was pages from uh, my surviving underground work, which isn't really all that great. So, uh, quantity. It was it really worked off a of quantity. <laughs> um, social media. Uh, what's really important in social media is 
I'm sure we've all seen people pushing their Kickstarters on social media and we just get sick of them. I know I do. Oh, it's that guy posting again about his Kickstarter project. I know either I did it or I didn't and seeing it again is not gonna make me go to his Kickstarter project and pledge. But what I did was I offered value. I came up with uh, 40 um, graphics from my uh, from my books and I use those I didn't just always put the cover up there you know everybody's always using the cover um, different things and I approached it in different ways I I, uh, I wrote a little bit about why I did the projects I, I made videos I had three videos one on each story in these three books on why I did the stories and where they came from I actually interviewed myself I, I didn't have you around to interview me to, do, to film this. Yeah. I set up the camera, and then I looked off to the side as if I was talking to somebody. And, um, it worked great. It, it really, uh, really looked like I was talking to somebody. Um, so you got to offer value. You don't want to just punch at people. You want to, and that same stuff that you set up for social can also go to your email list. Can also go out in the different ways that you communicate with people. So it's very important to set all that up too. Uh, backer updates, same stuff could go to your backer updates. You wanna be real personal with your backer updates. You wanna talk about things in a personal way because uh, these, your backers, like I said before, are uh, I really want you to succeed. So you wanna be very personal with that. Let them know about you. Let them know the, the troubles you're going through, getting things together. And then comes the dead zone. I know it's really boring, but there's that part and everybody has it in a Kickstarter. Don't get frustrated because you get that big kick at the beginning and then somewhere in there, it's just gonna level out and you're not gonna get anything. And then you get the big kick at the end. Everybody's, everybody's wave is different, but everybody ha has this dead zone. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? Well, you can just keep plugging away at it. You don't get frustrated. Just know that everybody has it. I am so glad that uh, by by studying Kickstarter projects and uh, people talking about Kickstarter projects that I knew that this was going to happen. Because then when it happened, I wasn't too awfully worried about it. If I didn't know it was going to happen, boy, I would have just been, ah, what's going on? What's going to happen? But I ended up at 142% at the end because of that big kick at the end. All right, speaking of the end, there's your end. Uh, big push at the end, which is great from a marketing perspective to create a sense of urgency. How often have you heard in ads, our final days, you know, 24 hour sale, you know, Mark fans having a sale, again. <laughs> but it must work for them because they keep doing them. Um, that create a sense of urgency, that's great. Oh, I, had a, I found a place where I could uh, load a timer on my emails, and I use motionmailapp.com, but there's a whole bunch of other free ones out there you could use, but I just love to look at that because people got this email and it had this timer, days, minutes, seconds, down to when my Kickstarter was gonna end. So I'm talking about uh, setting a sense of urgency on it. One thing you wanna be uh, aware of right at the beginning when you're setting up your budget is backer attrition. A certain amount of backers will not come through with their money. Uh, so you wanna estimate about 2% for that. Um, at the end of your Kickstarter, there will be se uh, seven days to make that work. Um, Kickstarter will get a hold of those people and you should get a hold of those people too, in a nice way, and say, hey, your funding isn't going through, maybe you're Maybe your your uh, card is not valid anymore or something. Uh, you know, you only have a couple of days to fix this. Please fix this right away. And then at the very end of the thing, you have your surveys you send out. You want to be very careful with your surveys and think them through quite a bit because you only get to send your survey once. Um, you have to collect the right information from the right people that you need. Uh, mailing addresses, emails, um, your different uh, levels that you have might have to have different information. So you wanna think that through and think it through again before you send out those surveys because you can only do them once. Not that you can't get a hold of people afterward, but boy, is that a pain in the butt when you're trying to uh, get people their product after the Kickstarter's over. 
mistakes. This might be, other than uh, at the beginning, this might be the most important part of this talk too. Postage. Postage kills. Everybody screws up postage. Postage changes. You can have your you can have your Kickstarter set up and, and allow for a certain amount of postage, especially international. And by the time your Kickstarter is over, the international postage rates have changed. And that'll really uh, that'll really mess up your your Kickstarter. Um, how I did it was I just offered everything digitally. <laughs> I so many people uh, that I listened to said that the the postage screwed them up. That I said, well, I'm, I'm just gonna skip that all together and just do digital awards and bring my price way down because I can because I'm not mailing things to people. There's Kickstarter fees, there's Stripe fees, and that's uh, collecting to, the fees to collect through um, through the credit card, and then the attrition I talked about. So all of these things. Um, let's see. What do you? Uh, so I added 10% to my budget to cover. Kickstarter fees, which is around somewhere around five percent, Stripe fees, which is somewhere between three and five percent, and attrition, somewhere around two percent. So add ten percent to your entire budget, and you should be okay. But watch that postage. You know where postage screws people up too is they'll be in the middle of the project and they've done their math and everything's just really great, and they start getting to where they're giving away extra rewards. You know. Uh, um, uh, rewards after they reach their goal. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could throw this at them? Wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? But what they don't understand is at the end of the thing, they're going to have to mail this, and everything they add adds to the weight of that mailer, and by the time they get to the end of it, maybe they've got uh, a whole lot more in postage than they thought they were going to get in the first place. Um, one of the most brilliant things I uh, learned from Comics Lunch to do to avoid that is you know how everybody likes signed books well books are heavy though so instead of sending people signed books uh, send, mail them the books with the regular postage and just send like a book plate you know get book plates printed up that they can put in the book and sign that because that's going to cost you way but you know you can send that in a regular envelope for regular postage and besides you're not getting books shipped to you signing every single one and shipping books out again and that's that's double shipping on the thing all right uh fees surveys you gotta make sure your survey's right that's where mistakes come in uh late delivery people don't like late delivery but mm -hmm. at least if you can explain to them why things are late that's that whole personal thing um they might understand so just in conclusion for success on kickstarter Build a community first. Uh, be as close to finish as you can with your product. You know why? Is because then you have more visual things to share with people once the thing gets started to keep them interested in it. Because if you just keep showing them your cover, it's not gonna work. Study and back other Kickstarter projects. You can learn a lot from other Kickstarter projects. Uh, do the math. I know we're, we're artists and illustrators and stuff, we hate math, but mm -hmm. make sure you do the math, write it all out and check it over and over because it's the math that's gonna mess you up. And keep it simple. Your pitch, keep it short and simple, keep your video short and simple, it doesn't have to be big production or anything, people like that personal touch to it. Be very visual and just keep your communication simple because as, as uh, well as I did at explaining all of my levels, I. I still got, I swear half the people didn't read it or half the people didn't understand the levels when they when they pledge. That's that's not good to think about, but the simpler you keep it, the more they are they would be willing to understand the whole thing. And that is my presentation. Do we have any questions on, on anything? I did too good a job about covering every little thing, right? Yep. Did everybody get these uh, these addresses at the beginning. Resources for professionals at azern.com slash resources PDF. And then if you want to join the pro uh, email list, that's at indiecomicsmagazine.com slash pro.html. All right. How, how, how'd I do? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Do your homework because there's a lot of ways you can get screwed up in a, in a Kickstarter campaign.